Just a, a quick announcement before we open the meeting. If you want to earn CE for attendance at the board meeting, please see Dixie Van Allen. Dixie is yeah, raising her hand. Dixie. This is a public meeting of the Board of Chiropractic Examiners. The date is October 24th, 2017, and the time is 9-11. 9-11. The location is Life Chiropractic College West, Assembly Hall, 25001 Industrial Boulevard, Hayward, California, 94545. The board's paramount responsibility is to protect the health, welfare, and safety of the public through licensure, education, and enforcement in chiropractic care. Please be aware that this meeting is being audio and video recorded for live webcast. Please turn off or silence all cell phones. We will now take roll call. Dr. Azlino, would you please call the roll? Dr. Heather Dane. Here. Mr. Frank Rufino. Present. Dr. Azlino, present. Dr. Algener. Present. Dr. Lickman. Here. Dr. Dion McLean. Present. And Dr. John Rosa. Present. All members are present here. Mr. Rufino, would you like to lead us in the pledge? Yes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So I'd like to thank Dr. Oberstein for hosting us at Life West. Your hospitality and your interest in the board is very much appreciated. If you'd like to Say a few words, you can. I also would like to thank the, the board, our esteemed chairwoman and, and board members. Thank you so much for the work that you do. I, I know I've sat on many boards and it goes unnoticed and the time and the hours that go into the work that you do and I want to thank you and thank you for protecting our public. Obviously that's what the main role is. Um, we're very excited that you're here. If there's anything that we can do for you to make your meeting more productive and more efficient, please just let us know. I'll have somebody on guard for you so that, uh, that they'll come up during your next break and let you know if there's anything that you do need. Um, there'll be students coming through throughout the day. Uh, it's, a, it's a very busy day in classes, obviously, and we do have this rule about a 10% attendance policy cut, but they will be coming through, especially probably during lunch. I'm not sure. I think the schedule was 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 sent to us, um, but uh, I know that during the time when you're doing the disciplinary hearings and things like that, that's a big interest. Uh, and the other thing is I just want you to know that um, our, our home is your home, and any time that you're in the Bay Area, we would love you to think of Life West as for your, for your meetings. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. You have a beautiful facility. Next, I'd like to introduce our new legal counsel, Mr. Kenneth Swenson. Mr. Swenson joined DCA as a senior staff counsel in May of 2017. He earned a Bachelor of Science in Biological Science from California State University. He also attended UOP and earned a Juris Doctorate from McGeorge School of Law. Prior to coming to DCA, he worked as an adjunct professor at McGeorge School of Law. He was an associate attorney at Duncan, Ball, Evans, and Ubaldi law firm. He previously worked as a deputy attorney general and thereafter formed his own law firm. He comes to us with a breadth of experience and knowledge. I'd like to introduce Mr. Kenneth Swenson. Thank you, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here and look forward to working closely with the board to further its objectives of protecting the health, safety, and welfare of Californians. Well, Thank you. Um, board members, if, um, if you would, so that for the video that um, um, it picks up all of the conversations, um, can you please speak loud or remember to speak loudly when you're talking? Okay. Thank you. Next, I'd like to give a heartfelt welcome to the students that are attending today. You are the future of this profession, and I'm glad to see that you're interested in the regulatory component of chiropractic. When I was a student, I had no idea about licensure or regulation. I was in Iowa, I was going to be licensed in California, and it all seemed so obscure. An opportunity to get a hint of the BCE and what it was all about would have given me a glimpse behind the curtain. 
I had very little interaction with the board till I was a board member, thank goodness. And every student and licensee who are not familiar with how their regulatory board operates is doing the profession a disservice. Most of the information and feedback I hear about the board comes from lack of knowledge or misinformation. I hope that having you here today is one small step to our licensees understanding what the board actually does. This year, the board has had many significant accomplishments. We developed and have begun to implement a new three-year strategic plan. In addition to our mission statement, which is to protect the health, welfare, and safety of the public through licensure, education, and enforcement in chiropractic care, we adopted a vision statement, excellence in care for all Californians. To support our mission and vision statements, we are working with stakeholders and licensees to ensure competency in educational standards, continuing education, and public awareness of frequent areas of discipline. We completed an occupational analysis. This occupational analysis defines actual job tasks that newly licensed chiropractors must be able to perform safely and competently. This information is used as the basis for the licensing exam. We recently completed desk audits and we'll hear more about this process and the outcomes today from Dan Eds. The BCE completed or is working to complete several regulatory, regulatory legislative mandates. These are changes in our regulations that are required by new legislation. Finishing these legislative mandates will allow the BCE to work on regulations that are more chiropractic specific. This year, we have also taken advantage of several opportunities to interact with students, licensees, and stakeholders. This was a group effort with many board members taking time out of their busy lives. I would like to thank Mr. Rafino and Mr. Puglio for representing the board with myself at the CCA Legislative Conference. I would also like to thank Dr. Azzolino, Dr. Lickman, and Mr. Puglio for representing the board at the CCA Convention. Mr. Puglio and I were able to represent the board at the Federation of Chiropractic Licensing Boards, and Dr. McLean spoke to students about ethics and the BCE at Southern California University of Health Sciences. Dr. Elginer represented the board and was a speaker at the state's future leadership development meeting. In addition, I was able to represent the board at CCA convention, my local CCA meetings, FCLB, the NBC Part 4, and the NBC Part 4 exams. Finally, I extend my sincere gratitude to Robert and the entire board staff. The work that goes on behind the scenes is immense. Everybody at the board works very hard and makes the work look seamless. A special thanks from me this year to Robert, Marcus, Dixie, and Valerie. Your help, guidance, and cooperation this year has been invaluable. I look forward to the accomplishments of this board in 2018. And finally, I'd like to make a special presentation to Dr. Julie Elginer. This is going to be our last meeting with our public member, Dr. Elginer. And our board could not have asked for a better member. Dr. Elginer is committed, she's organized, she's thoughtful, and worked what seemed like 24-7 for this board, in addition to all her other responsibilities with teaching at UCLA and being a great mom to her family. So Dr. Elginer, you have held us up to a higher standard while you've been at the board and helped us think about things in ways that we wouldn't normally have with your public perspective. And I'd like to thank you for being part of our board and you will be missed very much. Thank you very much. That was a lovely surprise. Thank you all very much. You know, as I was flying up here from Los Angeles yesterday after a very long day of teaching at UCLA, uh, I was reflecting on five and a half years of serving. And for those of you that don't know, for the public members, we're not tied to this profession. Mr. Rufino and I were, are, just like everyone else, appointed by the governor largely to serve in a public protection role, but to bring a consumer or a public health perspective to the discussions. 
And we don't, we have nothing to gain for the chiropractic profession. We do it purely because of our love of public service and our commitment to civic leadership, as do the other members of the board, but in a slightly different way. And so uh, Dr. Dane and Dr. Azzolino and I were appointed on the same day in May of 2012. And we walked in and we met with the governor and he said to us, all three of us, who's a mixer and who's a straight? Right? Isn't that exactly what he said? Mm -hmm. And I thought, what did I get myself into? I have no idea what he's talking about. None, none whatsoever. And so in the five and a half years that we've served together and served on this board, um, you know, we've agreed to disagree sometimes professionally and respectfully and done so in a way that I think elevated the decisions and the discussions for all of us. And in the meantime, we formed friendships. We cared about one another's families. We've cared about one another's health and their person, you know, their well-being. Um, and that extends to the staff as well. And so I just want to say, as I was flying up here yesterday, I was thinking about all of that, and I'm truly going to miss you um, individually, collectively, and I want to say thank you for the time that I've been able to serve. I really appreciate it. It's been a wonderful, it's been a wonderful gift. So thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Julie. Okay. Well, we're going to move on to agenda item number five, then. Um, approval of the July 25th, 2017 board meeting minutes. I have a couple of questions. Uh, <coughs> Uh, can we have a motion before we have discussion? Oh, I move to approve the minutes from July 27. Any second? Fun no, sorry. Second that. sorry, wait, I rescinded it because I said July 27. Oh, I'm sorry. I move to approve the minutes from July 25th, 2017. I'll second that. Okay. Discussion, Dr. McLean? Um, on page two. I'm um, sorry, Dr. McLean, would you mind speaking up? Oh. On page two, uh, at the Third line, the beginning of the sentence was a featured speaker. Was that Dr. That was, was is that com sentence complete? Who was a featured speaker? Did you read that? Oh, yeah, I think they're just referring back to, uh, probably it looks like Dr. Azzolino. Or Dr. I thought it was Dr. Azzolino. Or, yeah, it's grammatically incorrect. Yeah. But, so, um, just the grammar there. Yes. On page three, the second paragraph um, that uh, at the end of the sentence, cost analysis of all fees, fee charged. So one of those should be removed. Um, it's just a typo. On the sixth paragraph down, Mr. Puglio provided and overview. It should be and, just a typographical error. A N, not A N D. And that's it for me. There's another typographical error for me on page three, second, par second bullet paragraph. Once the fee audit is complete, should be comma. Board staff will work with the legislature to realign the boards rather than a period there. Any other discussion? Any public comment? Dr. Okay, Dr. Azlino, yes. Dr. Dane? Yes. Rufino? Yes. McLean? Yes. Algener? Yes. Rosa? Yes. And Lickman? Yes. Okay. okay, we'll move on to item number six, our executive officer's report. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, so, um, I'm uh, on uh, the agenda under six, there's um, items A through F. I'll go through them in order. Uh, the uh, first off, administration, um, board staffing. Uh, 
there's uh, an organizational chart included in your um, in the handouts. Uh, and right now, we have two vacancies. Um, two of our longtime employees, uh, Linda Shaw, who was our uh, assistant executive officer, and Jeannie Mitsuhara, who was uh, uh, an analyst who oversaw our uh, continuing education program. Um, they both retired. So um, I want to publicly acknowledge them and their service to the board. They were both a long term, very devoted to the board. And they were um, invaluable to me when I first started. They were both there and had been there for a while. And, uh, and I don't know that I would have made it through the first couple of years without their support and guidance. So um, I just want to publicly acknowledge um, both of them. So we uh, are in the process of the starting the recruitment process to replace both of them, and um, I will give you updates on that at the future meetings. Um, also, behind the org chart, um, for those in the audience, um, there there is um, there's a few pages that have definitions um, of all of the. So if you're looking at the org chart and you're wondering, you know, what does a compliance manager do or what does a probation monitor do, it gives a description of their duties. Okay, under uh, <coughs> excuse me, under six B, we have um, our fun condition. Um, as you can see, and as we've discussed at previous meetings, um, our um, our fund is um, slowly decreasing. Um, this is because we, there's an imbalance between the revenue and expenditures, which we're, we're in the process of addressing. We're working with the uh, legislature. But right now, we have, um, there was legislation, SB 547, which um, was carried by Senator Hill, who's the chair of the Business and Professions Committee, uh, that in temporarily increases our fee from $250 a year to the, the renewal fee, I'm sorry. Uh, from $250 a year to $300 a year. That's just for one year. Um, in the meantime, we're working with um, with Mr. Eds, who'll be um, speaking um, a little bit later. Um, he's he's a um, representative of the capital accounting firm, and they are um, they he's done a fee audit of um, all of our fees that we charge: the um, license renewal, the um, initial application fee, the satellite certificates and so on and so on and so um, he's conducted a comprehensive audit working with staff um, to determine what would be the appropriate level of all fees so um, so this year we'll be presenting a package to the legislature to is, am i coming up yes. oh mine's not um, is somebody's phone vibrating so um so um so um, we've uh, we've concluded that fee audit, and um, we'll we'll be presenting um, a complete package to the legislature um, that will recommend um, that all of our fees be realigned to um, to the appropriate le level, so they're consistent with the workload and um, expenses involved in uh, performing that particular task. Uh, so we'll have more about that later, but. Um, there will be legislation and probably a regulation package um, in the in the future to address all the fees. So but, um, the public will have a, an opportunity to comment on those fees and um, express any comments or concerns. So uh, that's all for our fund condition. Unless anybody has Mr. any questions. Julio? Yes. Um, there's bound to be some backlash from the profession anytime a fee increase. What in a real concise way? If we are asked, you know, why are you doing this? It just the revenue is not matching the expenditures. Uh, yeah, um, our our costs continue to increase. Um, salaries, you know, cost of everything goes up. Salaries go right. up and benefits. Um, the um, our overhead costs, such as rent and um, you know, and the pro rata fees that we pay to the state for the services that the state provides. Like, you okay. know, there's control agencies and. They all charge us for their services. We have um, services that are provided by the Department of Consumer Affairs. And so these things continue to increase. And um, it's been about seven years since we last seven years. increased the, uh, the fee. So it's, it's just gotten to the point. Uh, but you know, one thing I want to reemphasize is that we haven't, um, because of uh, just the political climate at the time, uh, when we last increased fees, uh, 
the board wanted to address all of the um, all of the fees, not just the renewal fee. Um, however, because of the political climate at the time, um, we weren't able to go in and address um, those other fees, and we only raised the renewal fee. So what um, what I'm hoping to do is um, you know mitigate the the you know increase in the renewal fee by raising those other fees to the appropriate level. For instance, a satellite certificate which we issued quite a few of those, only cost $5. And um, that doesn't nearly cover the staff time and expenses involved in issuing a satellite certificate and renewing it. Um, so we're, we're going to be uh, proposing raising those fees to an appropriate level so it's not all licensees subsidizing the satellites, um, same for corporation um, approvals and, and so on. Um, so um, hopefully the... Um, licensees in particular will be supportive of this because we're we're doing our best to keep um, costs to a minimum and as the um, the report from mr. Eds indicates um, it's not um, it's not a management budget management issue we um, we actually uh, operate relatively efficiently or very efficiently I would say and so um, you know it's not that we're spending too much money it's just that um, the costs continue to go up and revenue hasn't so and can I also because make licensees go are not licensees are going down, um, costs are going up, licensees. Are going yeah, down. that's a, that's another. Yeah. I forgot to mention. Thank you. Um, our license population continues to decline. Um, that was something I was going to bring up when we um, get to the next tab. But our um, license population can you, continues to decline gradually. But um, you know, it was about a decade or so ago that we had fifteen thousand licensees. Now we're um, we're very close to going under thirteen thousand. Um, I believe we have thirteen thousand one hundred and fifty-one or something, fifty-six. So um, you know, and we see that decline every year. We've been watching that very closely. And Can I also just make one comment that yes. came from the board? Uh, excuse me, the independent auditors um, on page fifteen of that, John, Dr. Rosa, yep. under general observations. Yes. Uh, the first sentence says, the primary observation is that the board has a history of conservative fiscal management and is taking a proactive step to ensure long-term sustainability. So that is an independent observation specifically right. that you can draw from. I wonder, and not to be out of turn or whatever, it, are we prepared to, when the time comes to put some kind of publication out or something like this? To the everyday chiropractor. Yeah, there will have to be some messages. Yeah, th these are these are all public documents, and so um, you know, so the report will be available to the um, to the public. We, we could even um, post it on our website, and and also as far as notifying the licensees of the upcoming fee and any future changes in fees, <coughs> that will be um, addressed in our newsletter, which um, we we have our content. Um, for the upcoming newsletter and now we're just in the final stages of um, getting it published and um, disseminating it so before the end of this year we'll have a newsletter out and we'll be um, announcing the fee increase in there we're also inserting um, inserts into each renewal notice to, to make sure that um, every when people get a renewal they're um, prominently advised that the fee has gone up thank you very much okay thank you Okay, on to 6C, um, and a, as I um, had mentioned, we, um, our current uh, license population is 13,156. And if you look at the, the handout, the um, licensing trends, you can see just from um, July, it's, you know, each month it's gone down a little. And we, we do see that from, you know, during each year, we see um, slight fluctuations throughout the year. Uh, but uh, but the trend has been pretty constant, and it may certain times a year, January and June, we usually get uh, more um, new license applications, and so sometimes those will spike a little. But um, but the overall trend is downward. So, Dr. Oberstein, not to put you on the spot here, but um, how has the trend been since you've taken over here at the school as far as uh, enrollments? Has it been steady? Has it been going up, going yeah, down? Okay. 
technical out of level up in the last, let's say, let's say 24 months. And in comparison to the other schools, do you have an idea? The iPad reports are going to be coming out uh, next, hopefully next week on that, or first week in November. So I'll be able to tell. I have no idea what the school is. So the iPad report comes out. That tells us what all the schools are doing. Okay. We'll have it. We have to Great. Send it. And what's the current enrollment here? Uh, close to 652. Okay. Thank you. So, and um, we will be reporting um, later from the licensing and continuing education committee, but uh, we recently had a meeting where we invited representatives from some of the national associations to participate, and um, it appears to be a trend across the country that enrollment and um, licensed populations are declining. So that's something that they're aware of at the national level, and they are, um, they are researching that and um, paying close attention to that. <coughs> Uh, does anybody have any questions about licensing? Okay. Um, on to compliance. Um, it's fairly early in the fiscal year. The, uh, the compliance unit stats uh, handout shows you going back to fiscal year 13-14, um, already up through the current 17-18. And so 17-18 is just a partial year. Um, it's the year to date. And so um, there's um, there, there are no real anomalies um, to speak of. This provides you with um, every case, you know, the number of complaints received and, um, and the disposition of all of those um, um, down through you know, accusations and statement of issues and everything. So um, I, I don't know if any of the board members have any questions about the um, enforcement stats. Okay. There's also for the um, for the members of the audience. There's also some graphs um, behind that that um, just put those stats into the <coughs> Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm the one who's scolding other people. Um, so um, so IT updates. We're you know we're still in the process of working with the Department of Consumer Affairs to do process mapping. Um, which is, um, we've been working on this for several months, and we have uh, representatives from the department meeting with our staff uh, four days a week. And we've, um, we're have we mapping every process, every task that um, staff uh, performs. They're, they're going through and creating a map of that, and that's going to inform um, our um, IT needs. So, um, and also, as they're doing this, they're, um, they're mapping the as-is process and then they're going to provide us with a map of it could be uh, the process and recommend um, you know, ways that we could achieve efficiencies. Most of these efficiencies would be achieved through uh, an updated IT system. Um, but before we can get that IT system, we need to identify what our needs are. Um, and then that'll help us choose the system that's most appropriate for us. So we're, we are making progress in that direction. It'll probably be um, a year to, or more before we actually have a new system in place. Um, but we are working towards that goal. And we're taking all the steps that the legislature and the administration require um, before we can um, purchase a new IT system. So I don't know if anybody has any questions about the um, IT updates or the mapping process. OK. Uh, then, as I mentioned earlier, um, SB 547 um, by Senator Hill um, raised the temporarily raised the fee, and I just it's worth mentioning it again because I um, we have few um, options for notifying everybody of the fee increase. So I just want to get the word out, um, and any associations or um, you know, the schools, if you have publications that you send out, if um, if you have an opportunity to um, include a blurb in there about that, it just we want to let as many people know as possible. And I'm sorry. So, the, no, I was just asking any of the associations or the schools, like if you have newsletters that you send out to alumni or anything, you know, that um, if you know if you um, if you wouldn't mind putting um, you know just a, a blurb in there, letting um, licensees know that. Um, the fee, the renewal fee, will be increasing this coming January, um, and so it's a temporary fee increase for just one year. But um, just want to get the word out as as well as we can. Do we want to stress that it's for one year because it's likely going to be ongoing? So yeah, yeah. I mean, the fee is going to be changing ongoing, but but the, the the fee that we're getting right now is just for one year, and then it will likely, most likely, 
um, change again. Um, and so it won't be a dramatic change, but it will change again next year. Does it say that in the publication as well, that it's a one-year change and then? Yeah, in the newsletter it'll say that it's a one-year temporary fee increase and also in the um, the notice that we put in the renewal notices. So they'll, you know, if nothing else, licensees will um, be notified at the time that they receive their renewal notice, which is usually about 90 days in advance that there's a fee increase. but. Um, like to give as much um, heads up as possible. Is there also information on newsletter stating a little bit, not necessarily why, but that you know that what we talked about before with you know the independent study, give them references to hey you can look at why we're why this is going up this year. I mean I know some people don't. It's we, we, we could get caught in that conversation forever, and I, I know. think people I, that are in practice do understand the cost of living increase, and, and our, our fees are not commensurate with things out there. Five dollars for a satellite certificate, the paper probably costs more. I was going to go there later. So, yeah. um, I, I mean, I don't think we need to spend yeah, too yeah, much and, time. Um, yeah, and I don't believe in the um, in our the newsletter article. I don't it's believe we do mention um, the fee audit, but but that that is uh, we can put something in there and let them know that you know if yeah, they want more information, they can go to the board's website. A link would a link would end all. Here, click yeah. here to read. Very done. So okay, well time. yeah, we'll include a link <laughs> to the a fee audit. Comments here. Yes. Moving on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Along those same lines, they found a point of contact with the San Jose Center where We're not being overly formal, it's just so, so that uh, Mike. Mike can pick it up. Mark Ziegler, Vice President of Institutional Advancement with Black West. If you'll provide us with a with a public statement from the board, we can put it in our in our uh, newsletters or notifications to our alumni and stakeholders. Oh, great. Thank, Thank you. you. I think what's going to be best is if we just provide the schools and the CCA with yeah. an official yeah. statement so well, that there's no, uh, you know, the yeah. one to interpretation. Yeah. And I so, realize that a lot of your alumni are probably in other states, so it won't be relevant to them. But just if, you know, we just like to, um, you know, I know a lot of um, Communication is word of mouth, so just get it up as much as possible. Then we can have the CCA disseminate it among yeah. all the chapters. Thank you. Quick, uh, quick comment. Uh, since we are talking about fees, I just wanted to. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the government and public relations committee has continued to work with and support the efforts of the executive officers and staff to get a fee increase to maintain the solvency of the board. Behind the scenes, the committee aided the efforts to get the board's fee in increase included in legislation and participated in meetings and conversations as necessary. <clears throat> However, SB 547 came so late in the session that the committee could not formally discuss and take a position on the bill. But fortunately, the governor signed the bill and it is now law. So just wanted to note that. And by the way, going forward, the committee will continue to work closely with staff to monitor any emerging issues and complete the remaining strategic plan action items. And to that point also, I want to publicly thank Senator Hill's office who has, he's been um, very helpful for the board and very supportive of the board over the years. and. That does not go unappreciated, uh, unnoticed. I think for, you know, as, as members of, you know, the state of California, you should know that in order for a fee increase to happen, a, an author, a legislator, has to carry a bill and has to introduce a bill on behalf of your profession. And so Senator Hill has been someone that over the years on pieces of legislation, we've been able to work with he and his office He's invited us to testify. We've participated in ongoing discussions with him. So I want to just publicly recognize Senator Hill's uh, willingness to work with the chiropractic profession. And as a, as a public member, I, um, that's important, but even more so for all of you that are chiropractors, you really should understand that he has your profession um, on the radar, okay? And that's Senator, Senator Jerry Hill. He's been a real advocate on behalf of your profession. So you might want to contact him and say thank you. A letter goes a long way. Yeah, point taken there. And uh, I, I just like to chime in here. 
it's extremely important for students and for chiropractors to understand that things don't happen just because you embrace uh, a philosophy of, uh, you know, providing wellness to people. I mean, that's great. That's commendable. And we all do that. But we really need people like Julie here, Dr. Elginer, Mr. Rufino, that have no interest and no stake in our profession. All of us arguably have some interest in, in making sure this profession is moving forward. And it's very important to embrace not only these public members that have selflessly served, but also members of the legislature <coughs> and people out there in the community that are um, carrying our cause forward. So as much as you may not want to be involved in politics, as much as that may seem like a game that you don't want to engage in, things will not happen in this profession. And this profession will not move forward without us being very active in that regard. So I just encourage everybody to uh, rethink that, rethink that position and really understand that we need to embrace these people out in the community that are not chiropractors, that are really carrying the staff forward for us. So, um, and the students have a much, much greater uh, ability and influence than you guys think you do, and you're our future. So we don't like to look at you on any different plane than we're going to look at a, a colleague uh, across the across the table, okay? So thanks once again to Julie and Frank for all they've done. I did nothing. This was all Frank's. You've done a lot. I did nothing <laughs> on this bill. Nothing. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Um, Rufino, are you going to mention it all or maybe go back to um, Dr. Dane's report? Just talking a little bit more about the conferences or the visibility that we've had in the community, it seems as though almost all of us have either spoken or attended various events. Uh, I didn't even know that you guys were at CCA's Legislative Day and CCA's conference, and I knew you were at FCLB, Heather, but um, I, at some point, I'd love to hear more about how those meetings went and the visibility that you guys had at those meetings. I think they're really important. So I think, and I could be wrong, but we this was at the beginning the beginning of the year um, and when when the CCA legislative conference it was like a flurry of stuff all at the same time CCA legislation legislative conference not too long after that uh, CCA convention um, and it may have been addressed that was in at San the Diego? meeting yeah. Ah, yeah I think that was at the meeting that, that I you was were, on yeah. yes okay, okay and so okay. we we did okay, just perfect. short we had a booth there we had a lot of licensees come up and ask questions, a lot of questions about continuing education. Okay, um, great. We gave a presentation. Uh, Dr. Eslino gave uh, a presentation for CE. Yeah, it wasn't for the board. Yeah, not for the board, just... but for CE. Yeah, and, okay. Um, so it was, it I was bet great. you covered it at that meeting. Yeah, okay, yeah great, it was discussed you. at the July meeting. Okay, great. Thanks. Just a quick uh, uh, point. I know we give them uh, kudos to Senator Hill and certainly deserves all the kudos. Senator Hill is not only a great senator, but he's very supportive. But I also wanted to uh, let you know, too, that he's the chair of the BMP for the Senate. We also have a chair of BMP, Business and Profession Chair, in the Assembly. And there was a newly appointed, when I say newly in the past maybe four or five months, mm -hmm. uh, three yeah. months, yeah. This year. and that's the assembly member Lowe. By the way, if I have Lowe, and we had multiple informal discussion about the profession, and he's very supportive of the profession, and I'm very, very confident that he will be a great asset, and he will be at least open mind. He will have an open mind when uh, any one of us approaches him on issues related to the profession or, or, or related to the industry. So just want to, and both, by the way, and I will not, being from San Diego, being from Southern California, I will not hold it against you guys, but both of them, both legislators are right in your backyard. Uh, Senator Hill is San Mateo County, South, of, and uh, Assemblymember Low, I think it's a little bit lower, or San Jose. So they're right in your backyard. So any opportunity that you get, you interact, whether it's at a district level, uh, it's certainly, I think it's good. I do too. It's a good um, advice to thank them for their support and uh, let them know that we are watching them just as much as they're watching us. Oh. <clears throat> thank you. Frank, good job. Thank just, you. Um, and just to uh, piggyback on that, and I'll wrap up soon, um, to piggyback on that, uh, just for since we're at a college, uh, we take an opportunity to educate people who aren't familiar with the whole legislative process. and. Um, the the business and professions committees. There's one in each house of the legislature. Um, they 
they oversee all of the every bill or every piece of legislation that has something to do with a licensed profession goes through those committees. So virtually any piece of legislation that affects the chiropractic committee um, would go through both of those, uh, I mean the chiropractic board would go through both of those committees. And um, so, so those two legislators in particular, Assemblymember Lowe and Senator Hill, um, you know, if you have an opportunity to provide them with positive information about uh, the profession or, you know, if you uh, to educate um, them and their staff, um, the staff at the Business and Professions Committees, um, about the profession and the positive things that uh, the profession does, uh, that's, um, that's very helpful because the more they know about chiropractic, the more familiar they'll be when something comes through, you know, because they see so many bills, they don't know specifics about each profession. And so um, we try to provide them with, um, with up-to-date up information and um, make sure that they're familiar with us so that uh, they can call us when they have questions and that, um, you know, they, they're, um, they're more, uh, aware um, about chiropractic and so it makes they can make informed decisions about the profession and about the board so um, and then uh, finally I want to um, I want to mention that um, dr. Elgener um, also recently just a couple of weeks ago um, the department is a uh, department of consumer affairs they have a program it's a future leadership development program um, where they're taking um, younger um, new to state service employees um, who show potential for leadership and, um, and they have this intensive program that they're putting them through over the course of, uh, of a year that um, exposes them to, um, to executive level staff and to um, you know, the real issues that are facing the department and gives them opportunities to work on projects related to those. And um, recently, they invited Dr. The department invited Dr. Elgener to be a presenter at um, at a the forum they had for the leadership development uh, participants. And they had uh, they had uh, board members from four different boards, and just giving information about what it is you know serving as a board member and giving career advice and. Um, it was a very impressive and dynamic panel, and, um, and Julie, because of her uh, background and her her, edu her um, background in education and um, all that she's accomplished in her young life, uh, you know, she was an excellent um, inspiration for all of the um, for all of the participants there. And and I just want to personally thank Julie for all she's done for me and the board since she's served on the board. Um, although I'm 10 years her senior, I, I look at her as a mentor. Um, she's she's taught me so much. She she packs so much into one day more than I probably pack into a month. And um, she she's just she's accomplished a lot, and um, and she continues to push herself. And so she's an inspiration to me, and I've learned a lot from her. And I, I just want to thank you, Julie, for um, for everything. We're going to miss you. And that concludes my report. Okay. If uh, Dr. Osolino, if you would help us, we would certainly extend an invitation to Senator Hill and Assemblyman Lowe to visit our campus on a Friday seminar and address you know 600 students and our faculty and staff. Every Friday, uh, we hold to the philosophy that uh, when we sit down for fa for dinner at night, we talk. We talk to each other. That's the one time of the day uh, where we communicate. So every Friday for 45 to 50 minutes, we come together as, a, as an institution, uh, faculty, staff, and students. And we fill this, this uh, auditorium with uh, all of our faculty, students, and staff. And certainly, I think an invitation could be to the, those two individuals. And it would be nice if you could be here. And we could arrange that sometime in the next I'll uh, be happy to facilitate that. Yeah, I would love to have them, to have them on our campus, see what we do in chiropractic education, and and have our students exposed to the legislative process. Does can I can I ask, does Life West have a a lobbyist or a designated governmental affairs person? We work closely with the CCA and support their their. You have dialogue with the CCA and support where we can uh, their agenda. And I don't know that we have a lobbyist per se. We have legal representation that we. Okay. And that uh, would be a, so that, that'd be a better 
question directed to Dr. I'll reach out to you and uh, provide you with information because I, I think it would be best if the invitation came from the school. And oh, okay. so, so I'll um, I'll contact you and provide you with the contact information at the assembly and senators' offices, and, um, and you know who to extend the invitation yeah. to. And I'm sure they would be happy to participate. Just to let you know, that's that's something that we can do and uh, stay engaged. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions about the chairs? I mean, the, I'm promoting no. myself the executive officer's report. <laughs> uh, do you know if our next speaker's here? Robert oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, uh, so um, now I want to introduce Dan Eds. Um, there he is. Um, we're, um, he's, there he is. Uh, there he is. So, um, so Mr. Eds is with the Capital Accounting Partners LLC, and um, they've conducted our fee audit. Um, there's a copy of the fee audit in the handouts, um, and um, now he'll be making a presentation to us, and there'll be an opportunity to ask questions about the report or um, anything related to the fee audit. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. I talk this loud. Can you hear me? Okay. We will be able to. In a second, yeah. <laughs> oh, there okay. We go. And it works. Good. Well, thank you, and good morning again. Uh, my name is Dan Eds, and uh, I appreciate the chance of being with you this morning. A um, bit about me and our firm, Capital Accounting Partners. Uh, <coughs> Our organization uh, was founded in 2007 to do two things, one of which is to uh, uh, provide what's what we call indirect cost allocation services, which is a formal process uh, defined by the Office of Management and Budget from Washington, D.C., of how federal, states, and counties and cities should allocate uh, overhead cost allocation when they're asking for reimbursement for state or federal grants. Um, the other thing that we do is what we call cost of service studies, what you call a fee audit. Um, that's my particular area of specialty. Uh, I've done these projects since 2003, and uh, I've done them from pretty much uh, coast to coast, north and south, up and down the west coast primarily. And uh, just as a firm, we do appreciate the opportunity of providing this service to you. This is the uh, I just looked up, this is the eighth fee audit uh, that we've done for the Department of Consumer Affairs for the state of California, and I feel like I'm starting to get to know you all a little bit. Um, I do have a place for questions at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to stop me if a question comes up. Um, I also have the costing model that we developed uh, opened up, and so if there's uh, specific questions about that that you would like to address, I'm more than happy to do that. Uh, these reports are always a balance between too much information and too little information. Uh, sometimes I'm, I'm told, uh, stay out of the weeds and, and uh, make a presentation quick and short and sweet and then get off the table and, and, and get out of town. Uh, other times, organizations sign up, you know, want to get more detailed, and so I could, I could get as detailed as you want. Um, so the, this particular presentation, there's three parts to it. One is to look at the scope and methodology that we use to actually calculate cost. Uh, the second one was look at the fee requirements, which is really uh, what needs to be required in terms of revenue to fully uh, recover the cost of services. And then a quick uh, summary on some of our recommendations, which are pretty much common to all of the boards and bureaus within the department. And again, if, I, if you have a question, don't feel free to, I mean, do feel free to, to stop at any point in time. Um, this project scope, there's really three parts to it. Uh, one is to calculate the full cost of processing licenses for individual licensees. Um, a, a simple way of understanding that is this is, a, this is a project to figure out what it costs to pr produce a widget. Um, what does it cost to... Uh, take an application or a re renewal application, run it through the system, 
and uh, so that the board can, can fully be compensated for its cost to do so. Uh, calculate the, the direct cost of processing licenses and the allocation of support costs such as investigations, enforcement, and other support functions that may apply. Typically, these are uh, uh, administrative overhead, both from the state, from the department, within the board, and then even within various programs. And then developing long-term fee projections for five to 10 years going out. And that's what the project was designed to do. Let me also addre address what was out of scope or what the project was not designed to do. We did not look at issues of organizational efficiency, effectiveness. Um, we, uh, although I do a lot of work in that area with other organizations, so I'm pretty good at spotting, um, uh, spotting those kinds of issues when I walk in the door. We did not look at issues of organizational excellence or organizational performance. It was really pretty much strictly what does it cost to produce a widget. Um, also, this um, the, the word fee audit or audit, which is what the department uses, might be a little bit beyond or suggest a project beyond the scope of what I would normally suggest or would, would normally do. Um, this was not a financial audit that, a, that an accounting firm would, would do or a large you know, public accounting firm would provide for a large public entity. Uh, again, this was a fairly simple project. What does it cost to produce a widget? Some basic assumptions critical to the analysis. Uh, one is that current budget expenditure, expenditures will be spent. Uh, I have worked with a lot of um, state, uh, city, and county uh, municipal agencies who, uh, as part of their, their budget management, uh, consistently underspend their budget. They do that intentionally um, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but the, the assumption here and the data prove the assumption to be correct that um, that the organization is going to spend everything that's budgeted to spend. Um, so number two, in some cases, the projected number of licensees is, licenses issued has been lowered relative to recent trends, as uh, Mr. Puglio just addressed a few minutes ago. Uh, number three, the results are a snapshot in time and may vary depending upon when the fee schedule is adopted. So uh, if I understand the process right, you would maybe possibly vote to recommend an adoption of the fees today. It has to go through a legislative process and maybe some months, if not a year from now, um, the, the fees would be uh, authorized or adopted at the state level. Um, obviously, that all changes, at least to some degree, um, the, the, uh, the, the results. Any questions? So the methodology that we used um, is actually relatively simple in theory. Uh, the first thing we do was we try to establish what is the full cost of services. That basically is your budget and your expenditures. Uh, but then we also try to break those expenditures down into some core business processes and then uh, look at what is, um, you know, what are those, how do those core business processes consume resources? Sort of like, in the, it's kind of like the, the analogy of a house. Um, uh, you know, hot water tank, everybody has a hot water tank, and then there's a, a piping system that goes through the house. What we're really looking at is, well, how much water does the, the bathroom take, does the kitchen take, and does the front yard take, and the backyard take? Um, so we're looking at the core business processes, which is very fundamental to the analysis that we do. And then for this project and other projects within the uh, department, uh, a big part of it is how to calculate support costs. That is not just administrative overhead, but it's all of the various types of enforcement and investigations, which is a large component of the board. <coughs> so, uh, in, a, in a presentation like this, and even in conversations uh, with uh, Robert and with others, uh, if I was having a, a stakeholder meeting, someone would almost invariably say, well, how do you know that the data that you have is correct? And there's actually three tests, if you will, for data accuracy. One um, is if, you, if you're looking that way, um, it's right here. One is a summary of costs versus expenses. So 
I will build a, a costing model and a large Excel spreadsheet. And one of the things I'm doing is looking at dollars in, dollars out. So the budget numbers that we're, that we're looking at or that we use for this project was just under $4.1 million. When I take that $4.1 million and I run it through the model, I want to come out with a projection of revenue at full cost of the same amount of money. So if I have more revenue coming out of the model than what I have going in, somehow I've got problems with the data. If I have less uh, money coming out of the model than I have going in, again, I've got problems with the data. I actually have a, pro a plus or minus of 5 to 10 percent. This project was, uh, was uh, worked out really well. It came out exactly the same. So we've got $4.1 million going into the model. We've got $4.1 million coming out of the model. That means that my data is good, or at least at one level. Um, I also have another test, and that's dollar, or excuse me, hours in and hours versus hours out. In this case, I have 35,520 hours of staff time to allocate. And when I get done in the model, I see that I've got 35, oh, sorry, 35,520 hours coming out of the model. And this is a function of, of if, a, if, um, if a staff person spends one hour uh, processing any given a, uh, license and you do a thousand uh, licenses, that means there's a thousand hours of time consumed in that function. So um, in looking at staff, the total amount of time that we have to deal with, 35,000 hours, I go through, I, I plug all the numbers into the model. And I've got, again, 35,520 hours of, of time that's been allocated. That's my second test to determine whether or not my data is solid. And then um, the other one is I look at my projection of current revenues versus, versus actual revenues. So in my model, I project out $3,426,068 3, dollars of revenue from fees, and that's, that's the, the math is really simple. You process a uh, thousand licenses at about a hundred dollars. That's a hundred thousand dollars. My math is correct. Um, and so then I and then we add it all up for all of the various fees and licenses, and uh, then I compare that with what has actually come in, and the two should match. They never match exactly. But again, my plus or minus is about five to ten percent. And, I'm, and in this project, I'm 0.2%, which in my <coughs> worldview is like throwing a dart to the moon and hitting it. Um, so again, those are, those are three tests that I look at to, uh, for, in essence, for my own comfort, does the, is, does the data look good? Is it solid? Um, the, do I have you know, you, know, you know quality in, quality out, garbage in, garbage out? What I want to look for is quality data, and I, am I getting uh, quality data back out of the model. And then finally down here at the bottom, and I'll be getting uh, into more of this later on, but you see um, there's a, there is a difference between price and cost. So I established the cost of the service and then in conversations with staff and leadership, um, they actually projected out uh, some different, some fees that are different than actual cost, call that price. And so um, based on that those prices, uh, we projected out again just a little bit under $4.1 million. And then if we also include the cost of rebuilding your fund balance, or what I would typically call your reserves, add to that and now we're at $4.5 million of, of total annual revenues. So any question about that part? <clears throat> okay. So analysis of cost and expenses. Um, this is, a, again, a snapshot in time. It's really looking at your uh, revenues versus expenses for this fiscal year. And as you can see, again, from just the numbers I just showed you, four, a little, little less than $4.1 million of expenses, a little bit more than $3.4 million of revenues. That does not, not account for um, any fees or fines or anything like that because those are all, all revenues that are outside the control of the board. Um, 
and uh, a judge, a uh, jury, a court someplace can discount all of those all of those fines and anything they want to. So you don't really have a lot of control over it. So my tendency in these kind of projects is to discount that, and frankly, they're pretty minimal anyway. Um, and so you see the difference of six point uh, six million six hundred and sixty one thousand um, dollars in in my in, in, in my business uh, MBA math that says you're losing money. Um, and obviously you can't do that for a very long period of time. Now the question earlier uh, from uh, Dr. Rosa, I believe it was, about uh, you know, how do you tell, what do you tell your constituents, your, your fellow um, uh, uh, chiropractors, why is the fees going up? Um, simplistically, there's a lot of reasons. You know, you haven't, you haven't raised fees in six or seven or eight or ten years. I've seen organizations that haven't raised fees in 20 years. Um, so uh, uh, I, I do, I, I, I was quite serious when, uh, <clears throat> as Dr. Uh, Dean pointed out, um, you, are, uh, you are taking a very proactive step in, in looking at your cost and your revenues and, and keeping fees uh, up to date, so, which I really applaud you for. Um, but this chart right here shows that 33% of your total cost would be really the cost of processing licenses. 67% of, of your total cost is really enforcement. And that includes both internal enforcement, doing um, uh, you know, inspections, investigations, processing complaints, but it's also external costs coming in from the Attorney General's office. Um, and I'll show you a slide on that in just a moment. But um, uh, this relationship between enforcement costs and all other costs is very, very consistent with all of the boards and bureaus that have done similar projects with, within the department. Um, virtually every one of them shows this kind of relationship between enforcement and, and total cost. Uh, might vary, you know, percentage up or down either way, but, you know, uh, third, two thirds, right around that, in that, um, that, that general ratio, very, very common. If I saw anything that was materially different from this, I would probably think something's wrong. Um, but this is, again, very common. Um, and I've, this is the eighth one that I've done. And every one of the various boards and bureaus that I've done shows the same kind of relationship. Now, this one shows the, the red triangle there shows that 20 percent of total cost is consumed really with external enforcement costs. And that's from the Attorney General's office, that's from the Office of Administrative Hearings. Uh, so the 72 percent is all other costs, meaning all other administrative costs. It's all other internal enforcement costs. So the 28 percent is just really income and cost that's assigned to you, again, primarily but not exclusively from the uh, uh, California uh, Attorney General's office. And uh, if you think about it, 28% um, of your cost, you, can, you don't control. Uh, Mr. Puglio has no control over that cost. It's not like he can go to the Attorney General's office and say, you know, I'd like to go negotiate a better rate for you with you. No, don't think so. And uh, nor do you have, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, you don't have a lot of control over what cases go to the Attorney General's office. Certain cases meet a certain uh, threshold and they automatically go to the Attorney General's office. Am I, am I, am I You're correct, yes. Speaking that correctly, good, thank you. So again, 28% of your total cost, you don't have any control over. And what makes it even more challenging, and I, sometimes I look at, at, uh, at, at, at the directors and managers like Mr. Pulley and I think, how do you do that? I mean, how do you... How do you run an organization when you have, you can't control, you know, 28% of your, that's a big chunk of his cost, and he has no control over. Any question about that? Um, so again, I get my, uh, Dr. Uh, Ruza, am I saying that correctly? Rosa. Rosa, thank you. Yes, um, you know, the, um, uh, again, if, if I was speaking to your constituents, my response would be, the reason those numbers are, the costs are going up for fees is because of, you know, that number right there, and and frankly, and uh, that is consistent across all of the 
boards and bureaus that I've done. Enforcement costs primarily, but not exclusively, but primarily from the Attorney General's office is going up exponentially higher than all other costs. And it's not just by, you know, a couple of percentage, you know, it's not like an inflationary kind of a thing. It's going up exponentially higher. So can you do a fee audit of the AG's office? <laughs> that actually would be really I fun to do. <laughs> I, I actually have some opinions on why those costs are going up, but I'll, I probably should keep my mouth shut. <laughs> what is the average uh, uncontrollable cost in most organizations, given ours is 28%? Is that par? Yeah, it's very common. Uh, again, like the other, like the other uh, graph, you know, 33, 67, uh, you know, 28, that's very, again, I, I look at that and I think, yep, it's about right. I mean, there's nothing from my experience that says that looks odd. It just looks like, yeah, it looks like every other one that I've done. So it's, it's from, from my perspective, it's, it's very calm, right in line. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, moving on. So, uh, in these kinds of projects with, you know, 72, I think it was, percent of the total cost coming in from basically enforcement costs, the allocation of that enforcement cost is really critical. And there's basically three ways that we can do that. Uh, one is to assign individual licenses and overhead function. Um, you know, the higher the processing cost of the license, the more cost will be allocated. So we could take all of that enforcement, all of that in, uh, cost and basically treat it like an overhead function. Every individual fee gets some magic percentage of that cost. Um, second of all, assigning costs on the basis of how or who triggers the enforcement activity. So in some, uh, some of these projects with these various boards and bureaus, they have two, three, four different customer segments, if you will. And so we can look at how each segment will trigger an enforcement reaction and allocate the cost that way. Um, in your case, you have one customer segment, so you're kind of stuck. Um, the third way is to assign a flat cost per license. So every license gets a flat cost for enforcement. In this project, uh, we actually did, we used both number one and number two. So internal enforcement cost, uh, uh, in other words, your staff, Mr. Puglio's staff to do you know, processing complaints and, and, and investigations, that sort of thing. All of that cost we assign on a prorated basis across all of the various licenses. However, in incoming costs from the State Attorney General's office, we only assign, and this would be like number three, mm -hmm. we only assign to the renewal application. And I'll show you how that works in just a minute. Um, so this is a summary of the, actually the renewal, um, the renewal license, and I'll walk you through this. This is the, the actual numbers that, that <coughs> came out of it. So, and, and I guess the, the, the one big message, if you will, in, in, in both the looking at the board as well as this individual license, is the actual cost for processing a license is pretty minimal. Um, if you look at so that pie chart, you know, 60, 72 percent, whatever, is the cost of enforcement. That would suggest to me that the board is a regulatory body that's designed to enforce rules and regulations. And in fact, that's what this, these numbers actually show. So this number right up here, and uh, maybe I should switch everybody's necks and go to this one over here. 0.6 hours to for the initial uh, review of an application, you know, 20 minutes to do the actual application processing, multiplied times a direct hourly rate of $55.04. That means the total cost just for processing the a renewal application is $21.65. Okay, really pretty minimal. Now we haven't layered on top of that um, anything for overhead. It's just staff time. Productive hourly rate, just looking at salaries and benefits, dividing it by productive hours of 1,776, which is the standard that the, that the department uses. Um, that, you know, theory accounts for uh, vacation time, sick leave, holiday time, that sort of thing. 
Um, again, the 1776 is a, a, a used by convention because that's the number that the board uses. If I had to calculate the number, it would probably be a little bit less, but not in a material way. So uh, total cost actually processed the license is $21.65. Now, if we layer in on top of that the state pro rata, board and management administration, legislative regulatory activities, processing complaints, field and get investigation, uh, administration of the licensing unit, we can add to that another $109 of cost. Um, and then prorated cost for enforcement, and this is the external enforcement. This is from the, in, from the primarily from the AG's office, Office of Administrative Hearings, another $83. Um, total cost assigned is $214. Current price is $250, which means you're actually making 36 bucks. Um, any question about this, uh, this the, the analysis and the way this works? Okay. Going on? So building a sustainable future. And um, I, 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 with, with these projects with the department, I do find myself talking more and more about sustainability. Sorry, excuse me, sir. Could you go back just one sure. slide? In the report that we were provided, there's a note underneath this table, and I think it's important that that data does not include additional costs required to rebuild the reserves. Right. Right. And so I just want to make sure that, you know, um, that difference, it looks as though it's sustainable right now, the, what you have, right? The total cost assigned. For that one fee, yes. Right, exactly. Right. Right. So I just want to make, that, that's good. an important component good. that I just yeah. want to make sure is highlighted. Okay, good, thank okay. you. And I'll show you what that, uh, what that um, the additional costs for rebuilding your reserves. So we'll, 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 we'll do to this in fee in just a minute. But, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, so again, um, in, in these projects with various boards and bureau of the department, I do find myself talking more and more about sustainability. In some cases, it's solvency. Um, and so this is, and this data comes um, from the department. Uh, it shows at the end of this fiscal, yep, Sorry, push the wrong button. At this fiscal year, you will have uh, 1.9 months of fund balance left. At the end of next fiscal year, you will be just about at the breaking point, and the following fiscal year, you will be at the point of either insolvency or you'll be having to borrow money from the, the state somehow. Um, and again, these data comes from the from uh, the department, and uh, I. I, I'm encouraged by the fact that Mr. Puglio has taken a, the step of increasing that, that renewal fee so you don't get yourself into this kind of a, of, a, of a bind. I think that's being very proactive. So um, this particular slide is designed to provide you sort of a, a broad brush overview of everything major. So um, again, this is this first column going left to right. This first column shows your current budgeted revenues. The second one shows your current, uh, on, on terms of my model, your projected revenue difference of $661,000. Um, that little blue bar right there is your reserve fund requirement. That's the amount of money that's, that will be required to rebuild, begin rebuilding your reserves. And that's not rebuilding your reserves overnight. That's doing it over, I think I used a five year period of time. Um, so it's not like an automatic push a button and we're now back up to where we should be in reserves, but it rebuilds that reserve over time. The total between the negative red bar and the positive blue bar is $1.1 million, which essentially says we need to raise our fees so that we can uh, uh, recover an additional $1.1 million uh, of, of, uh, of expenditures. And then the difference, in other words, the total is the far bar on the right, $4.5 million. Um, that would be the total revenues if you chose to adopt the fee schedule as well as the re reserve fund requirements that we've built and that, that Mr. Puglio and his staff are recommending to you in terms of pricing. Any question about this? Okay. Um, 
so this shows you, um, this is really the, the renewal license. Uh, so $22 of direct cost, allocated cost of 109, enforcement cost of 83, adds $32 uh, to uh, to rebuild the reserves brings you a, a, for a, a total cost of two hundred and forty six dollars um, and again that's not necessarily price um, Mr. Puglio and his staff they're actually recommending a price higher than two hundred and forty six or even two hundred and fifty so that some of the other licenses can come down uh, to create uh, more of an equitable um, uh, situation with the various uh, organizations and people who want a license. Um, any question about this? Okay. So recommendations, next step. Um, one, set fees to recover actual costs plus additional for reserves. Um, I find myself just making that as a standard recommendation. Um, second one is raise the statutory cap to cover regular fee increases for at least five to ten years. Ten years is probably better. Um, I'm a huge proponent of uh, regular adjustments to fee schedules and so if you set your cap going out 10 years then and again I'm not an expert on the on the regulatory process but uh, regular at least annual or biannual uh, adjustments to fees are much easier to make and again Robert if I'm not saying this exactly right correct me if I'm wrong um, but uh, it's much easier to do that on a on a, uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on a regular basis if you set those caps out five or ten years. And then the other thing is establish some pricing guidelines. Um, this, um, this provides staff with a lot of guidelines of how to price an individual fee. Some organizations, they say, no, if it costs $100, I'm going to charge $100. Um, some organizations will say, no, we, we want to intentionally subsidize some groups for whatever reason, social economic reasons. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a customer segment uh, that has little power, little control. It's really somebody else that has the power, the control, and the money, so they want to pass more cost on to them. Always various reasons, but I do recommend some kind of a pricing guideline on, um, on your fees. And with that, um, I'll be quiet and take any questions that you might have. Yes, ma'am. I, I have more of a comment, and this is a combination of your presentation today and then you know, conversations that we've had when this was being developed. Sure. But just so that everybody understands, because not too many questions are being asked, but I just want to make sure that everybody understands that the, the, the pricing you are giving to the license renewal even though lower than the $300 that we're recommending is coming from other places, like um, the, the petition for reinstatement of a revoked license petitioner hearings that we hear have a huge amount of cost associated with them because of the administrative law judge, because of the court reporters, and if we were to put actual cost in that, it would be prohibitive for anybody to, to up to try to do that. And so that's being shifted more to the license renewal. So um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I just kind of want to no, put you. it in terms that I know I understand and that I'm hoping yep. everybody else will understand no, too. I think you're spot on. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you all. all right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, a question? Yes. Hi, my name is Dr. Phil Peters, San Jose, California. Hi. I was wondering if you had a breakdown of that cost analysis with regards to the um, satellite certificate fees and how that inequity is. Um, I can show you the actual cost analysis if you like. I've got it right here. Um, um, and I don't recall what we actually priced those at, um, but I would, I would let Mr. Puglio address actual why the pricing is different than the actual. So, and did you go over a proposed new fee schedule when I stepped out for a moment? No, we didn't. No, we didn't discuss report. specific fees. So, and I'm sorry, you were just asking about the satellite? Um, right. So he went through the whole cost analysis of where there's an inequity for a typical licensee 
with the administrative fees and et cetera, all the other costs. But we didn't see that same analysis and how much of an equity exists for someone who only has a satellite certificate. So for instance, what I'm looking for is we've got a group of people that are full-time practitioners paying the full fee. And then we've got some people that are practicing less than full-time in their opinion or <coughs> in their board, and they're only paying a certain fee. And so how much of an inequity is that and how many people are that? Or has that been looked at? And ultimately, because what I'm trying to avoid is how does the full-time practitioner bear all the costs of that? Where, as Dr. Azzolino said, there's a whole group of people with just satellite certificates that are basically no, they, no, they, have to have, they, they have, have to be licensed first. I think you're confused with what a satellite, the satellite certificate is, is if you have an additional office location in okay. another area. And then you need a satellite certificate for that office. But so, there's still a fee that's associated with yeah, generating that. If I can so, explain, yeah. the, um, every chiropractor practicing in California has a chiropractic doctor of chiropractic license. Um, so everybody, then those individual, um, say so I'll use Dr. Azzolino as an example. Um, if, if he has um, his practices in San Francisco, but if he also wants to have um, an office in San Rafael, that and he splits his time. He has to have a satellite certificate, and so he's paying just for that certificate. He still has to maintain his um, chiropractic license, but then in order to have that satellite certificate um, to practice in another location, um, he would have to um, obtain a, a satellite certificate. And right now, we're only charging five dollars for that. And the workload involved in um, issuing a satellite certificate is far more than five dollars. Right, and that's kind of what I was hoping to see. But maybe that's what you just provided me was. That I think it's a small portion of what we're dealing with. Okay. Uh, may I make a comment to the board? Under specific recommendations, uh, the presentation included uh, some of these, and, and I just want to think about how do we operationalize some of the pricing recommendations that were made. One of them is that I'd like to recommend that um, Included into our board member administration manual is some la some language about every either every three years or every five years that the pricing guidelines be reevaluated, just like we have language in there that every three years a strategic plan will be completed, as well as that you know certain requirements for board member participation on mail votes. That seems to me a reasonable place to ensure that our um, standard operating procedures include a review of the pricing guidelines. It does not m mean you have to do a, a fee audit. That's not what that's saying. It's saying take reasonable steps every three to four years to reevaluate the pricing structure and ensure that it still meets both revenue and expense projections. How costly has this fee audit been? The, um yeah, uh, to be honest, I don't recall the um, the contract. I mean, do you know the contract amount? Yeah, it was uh, eighteen thousand, a little bit more for expenses. Yeah. I think. That yeah. Yeah. Get this you don't need to do it. So we wouldn't do a fee audit. We would do a fee audit every time. It would just be what? reviewing it for appropriateness. It, if you're right. sensing every, every three to four years, if you're sensing that there's some discrepancy between revenues and expenses, that's when it's valuable to take the next step to make sure that the assumptions that were built in this model are still valid. And we already have the model now. You can plug in year-over-year -year data over three years and just make sure that it's still consistent. It's just a mechanism to be able to ensure that, um, that every three to four years that the board is taking a proactive look at it. That's what I'm saying. Do you think that's a fair characterization? Uh, thank you. I, I, uh, spot on. I couldn't say it better myself. Uh, my standard recommendation or something like that is uh, uh, update your fees annually, although it's probably a little more challenging for your organization than for me. Um, but at least every other year, uh, update the fees through a simple CPI type of, uh, of adjustment. Uh, and then every three to five years, probably closer to five, do a formal fee audit. Uh, because the regulatory environment will change, enforcement costs may change dramatically. Um, so I, I, I could not agree more. And would you go off of a just typical CPI, or is there another way of calculating that? Well, you know, the, the simple way 
maybe overly simplistic, is to say, okay, our cost of services of you know basically labor cost gone up four percent, raise the fees four percent. Um, next year, labor cost goes up three percent, raise them three percent. Um, on the other hand, with the cost of your external uh, enforcement costs, AG costs, um, increasing at a rate that's fairly exponential across all of the boards and bureaus within the department. Um, you know, I would look at that pretty hard and say, okay, what is that going to do to our cost? Our labor cost goes up 3%, but those costs are going up 10%. You know, make a, make a, a simple adjustment for that. And then every, you know, three to five years, go through a formal analysis of, of your costs and your revenues, because the, the regulatory environment, if nothing else, will change. And the regulatory environment has enormous impact on what it costs to enforce, you know, um, um, the, the whole program. Uh, what, what used to take 20 minutes to look at an application now takes an hour because the application is 10 times longer. Um, uh, what, you know, used to, given the regulation, the regulatory environment, you know, 100 um, uh, enforcement cases were triggered a year and now there's 300. All those things make a, a huge impact on your cost. So I have a question. So if we wanted to add language to the board member administration manual, is this something that could be assigned to a committee to put that language together? Yes. Yeah, that would be that would the be government nice. affairs uh, uh, or the or, enforcement. or the executive yeah. um, enforcement. No, because no. okay. it's the because it, uh, be licensing. Um, well, typically it's been the government well, affairs committee that's been responsible it. for the um, procedure manual. Okay. Oh, that's right, because they do do the so. Gover I'd like the Governmental Affairs Committee to put together language regarding that for our board member administration manual. To have a section that would basically recommend <coughs> to do this um, internal review, if you will, or the increase. There's um, ju just um, because this isn't the private sector, um, things, things that we have to do in government don't always make sense and um, one of the things is you know even though we may have the data the really the the trigger for us being able to because there's political forces um, more powerful than us i.e. the um, legislature and the, the administration whichever governor is in place at the time um, and most likely we wouldn't have approval to raise fees unless our fund falls below um, a certain level, and um, you know, historically we've underspent our budget, and you know so um, we can mm -hmm. we can try to calculate how much things are going to go up, but they they may not, and so we can't have an automatic. That's why, as um, Dr. Elginer was suggesting, we, you know we should reevaluate this, in particular if we if we come to a point where we have an imbalance between revenue and expenditure, and if we see our funds starting to decline. All um, this is all, all the language would say. You can yeah. use language that's already in there for the strategic plan. All the language needs to say is that we are recommending that every three to five years, the board takes a, an analysis of the fee structure using a methodology that has been presented in 2017. You know, and to be able to ensure that revenues and expenses are still as projected. I mean, just something like that that just says every three to five years we're going to look at this again. And it doesn't say you have to do a fee audit, and it doesn't say that you're going to raise fees. It says we're going to hold the board accountable for ensuring the fiscal solvency, you know, specifically through fees. That's what it's going to say. That's it. Well, yeah. So that'll be that'll be a simple uh, change to the manual. Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> since the chair made the recommendation, the committee will add it uh, to its agenda and to discuss and maybe come yeah. back with right. a exactly. language. And recommendation to the board. Correct. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Can we take a quick break? Yeah. Ten minute break. We're going to take a ten minute break. <laughs>